in preparation for our next discussion on approaches to ethics and virtue ethics. I want to go over a few topics from Reading Guide 3 on Chapter 3 of McClendon. We also have had on uh, the Moodle site some discussion activities about moral formation, spiritual formation, about the discussion of virtue in the Stassen and Kennison and McClendon books. And so I want to hit a few topics at this point to help you be ready for further discussion. First of all, uh, number three on Reading Guide 3 uh, is asking you about McClendon's interpretation of the work of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Whereas Bonhoeffer functions at this point in the chapter as a representative of a certain point of view. That point of view being those who would discuss uh, the issues of how to talk about human nature, nature and what is natural. Um, McClendon frames it using Bonhoeffer's words to say that justification is the ultimate word of gospel. Uh, ultimate being the final, the the most complete. On the other hand, it's not the only thing that we say about ethics. There are also other words to say, and that word penultimate means the words that come before uh, we reach the ultimate. And in particular, the, the penultimate word that he's asking about has to do with how do we understand creation and its relationship to ethics. And I asked you why is it hard to talk theologically about the natural. He gives you some examples looking at Paul Tillich, Reinhold Niebuhr, and how they talk about human nature. He gives uh, an analysis of process theology. Um, and so these are some of the attempts to address the doctrine of creation in uh, middle to late 20th century theologies. But let's talk about this issue of nature and why it is difficult to speak about. Um, there is a long tradition, and some of you have uh, been studying this uh, and trying to learn your terminology. There's a long tradition of, of talking about nature and its significance for ethics. And one of those terms that we use to talk about it is natural law. Natural law being the uh, principles of morality or ethics that can be understood as we study uh, the natural world. Natural law is a uh, systematic study of morality that uh, looks to understand what our purpose is, what we were made to be, how we were made to live. And so it's not uncommon in discussions of ethics to bring up concepts of nature. Uh, so we recognize that this is part of normal reasoning in ethics. On the other hand, we also recognize that it is a highly problematic theological category. Uh, it's problematic because we as, as Christians understand that theologically our nature our nature has been distorted or misshapen by sin and therefore when we observe the world in which we live and we observe the patterns of humanity what we always observe are patterns of humanity that have been affected by sin and we always observe through the eyes of sinful human beings. Consequently, any claims that we might want to make 
uh, strongly about nature as our guide in ethics must be tempered by the recognition that we may be failing in our understanding because of our own sinfulness and moreover that what we're observing has already been affected by sin. Consequently, making a strong claim about the natural in ethics is a very challenging and, in my own way of framing it, a dangerous way to argue in ethics. Now, Bonhoeffer was not the only one making this kind of argument. In fact, one of the uh, earlier uh, critics of the natural in reasoning about uh, humanity and about life uh, and ethics was uh, the German philosopher Karl Marx. Um, uh, Karl Marx recognized that uh, the claims that were made about what is natural and what uh, is human nature were shaped by large frameworks of understanding of what uh, society uh, believed human beings uh, should and ought to be. Consequently, in a society, for instance, that is organized around class or, or castes, um, the understanding of human nature is greatly influenced by how people fit into a class or a caste. Uh, it doesn't take us very long in American culture and a study of American history to realize that theories of human nature in most of American history have been dominated by the, the concept of race. Race as a fiction created to justify white supremacy. And therefore, uh, theories of human nature are thoroughly intertwined with a racialized understanding of people and their place within a racialized world. And so, uh, arguments about nature uh, affected by race are highly contrary to what we would judge a Christian theology ought to be. And so Christian ethics, to the extent that it began, it became dominated by race in, in American cultures, uh, uh, Christian ethics became distorted and became a tool of powers that seek to uh, promote their own interests and do so by theorizing race. And so, why is it hard to talk theologically about the natural? Because sin always already is in the midst of our conversation about it. So let me give a couple of other examples now, just to help us think about this. One is the relationship of nature and the natural uh, to, theology, to uh, epistemology or knowledge. Um, Again, in the context of race, those who have been categorized by race as deficient, inferior, etc., quickly realize that those who are in power are the ones who name what is natural. And so what is natural is what is in the interest of uh, those who are in control and in domination. So this is another example of why nature and natural problematic in ethics. Another, uh, we'll give a, a, an example related to um, uh, human sexuality. Um, it's not uncommon when you're reading uh, what people write about sexuality, uh, gender, and um, in ethics for them to make reference to the natural world. And so, for instance, um, some will look among other species for examples of long-term monogamous pairings and then use those examples as a way to um, help to support the idea that this 
is a trend or a tendency in the natural world toward long-term monogamy and therefore supportive of uh, a view of monogamous human uh, marriage, uh, which is the primary or even uh, only locus for the activity of sexual relations. Um, the problem with that is that there are plenty of examples among other species that don't uh, fit that pattern. In fact, one of the recent conversations about human sexuality in relation to other species uh, has emerged from a fairly recent research on a group of greater apes uh, very closely related to chimpanzees known as bonobos. Uh, what we find among the bonobos is not in any way a kind of um, single alpha male dominating uh, all uh, sexuality within a group, nor do we find a, um, a matriarchy in in which the males um, come to participate in sexual relations at the wishes of the females. Instead we find a species in which there developed a pattern of social interchange much like for us might be a handshake, even a hug, but beyond that for the bonobos it's an act of intercourse. And so almost every social interaction includes an act of sexual intercourse. Um, it's, almost, it's, it's like a greeting in that species. Now some would like to argue that, see, these, these loving apes who are more like human beings than other apes um, have shown us a way to avoid the kind of conflicts that emerge over property and territory and and uh, sexuality by eliminating uh, these kind of claims. Well, I mean it's an interesting reflection. It goes counter to most uh, other examples um, and it's one more way in which we see that people with a certain kind of agenda for uh, moral theology might uh, make a claim of the natural uh, as if it uh, somehow proves the point. One last uh, issue on uh, uh, example on sexuality, very famous um, Christian writer, um, lay theologian C.S. Lewis, uh, is uh, attributed to saying that uh, the pattern of, of sexual intercourse is itself a sign of the inherent uh, ordering of male as the dominant uh, uh, member of the species, the dominant gender, because the male sexual organ and pattern is outgoing and thrusting and um, the female on the other hand is receptive and open and this to him it gives further natural evidence of a certain pattern to gender relations. Um, again the shape of genitals doesn't necessarily prove a certain one certain thing or another to us about sexuality, but it does show that we, we are capable, but what Lewis does show us is how we're capable of taking an idea that we already hold and imaginatively applying it in any number of ways to try to support our argument. So, um, what is the problem with turning to nature? Turning to nature is always uh, uh, dangerously close to simply restating our prejudices. And so we must be very careful when we make arguments about the natural. And certainly what McClendon wants to remind us, and, and Bonhoeffer as well, is that we turn to Christ 
and the revelation of God in Christ as our guide and our lens by which to interpret anything in the realm of the natural. Okay, I'll, I'll do one other short uh, conversation with you about some of the other terms on this sheet. Let's uh, cut this one off at about 15 minutes.